Good morning. Welcome to the West Valley Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Karen Rice, and it's such a pleasure to be here this morning um, creating that space in consciousness, not only for our community, but for all those thinking souls that desire to align themselves this day to something that is greater than we are. I know that that great spiritual force in the, in the universe is a force of love, and I call it God, and I just know that right where we are, that infinite presence is already. So I know our time is blessed this morning, and I'm grateful for that because I have something to say uh, uh, as uh, usual. I have planned something rather spicy to talk to you about today, and I think that it's really relevant because um, we are... Uh, I'm sorry, we're bumping into each other here with some sound echoing in the building. I was just trying to figure out what that was. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today has to do with the, what's happening in terms of the calendar, how close we are coming to the elections, and though I am not going to talk about that, what I want to talk about is the spiritual guidance we can uh, tap into as, um, as things continue sort of in this uh, clunky way that it feels like they're going. I don't know about you. I'm certain I'm not the only one, but man, people are knocking at my door and calling on my phone and my mailbox as I shudder to look at the, um, the mail I'm getting just over the upcoming election. So the title of my talk is Emergent Evolution. And the purpose of the message this morning is to show us how God, Spirit Almighty, the infinite mind of God, uses everything for the purpose of good. And I do think we forget that. So I want to really hunker down and, um, and, and really move into that spaciousness of, of expanding consciousness in, in the idea of the ever-expanding good in the universe that we are a part of, especially when we are intentional in the way that we do that. So the quotations I'm using today uh, come from primarily from Dr. Ernest Holmes, and I will be speaking from the Science of Mind textbook where I found the term emergent evolution. And so let me give you a, a sort of brief definition uh, from Dr. Holmes that I found on page 273. Holmes says, when intelligence makes a demand upon itself, it answers its own demand out of its own nature, and it cannot help doing that. This idea is called emergent evolution. So life makes a demand. Something happens in the world, and now there's a demand for the, the, the reordering of the good we desire to have because it appears that we are possibly blocked from the flow of good or the flow of love or the flow of health, whatever, whatever situation you might be dealing with in your own personal life. But what I really want to focus on today is the way in which God, as that constantly emerging intelligence, is always putting things back in a perfect order, even um, faster than uh, things can get messed up. And often, things have to break apart before they get better. Before we can get rid of the old way, we have to allow it to break apart, fall away, so that then something higher and new can be um, um, delivered in, in the way that we uh, recognize the manifestations and the demonstrations of life itself on this planet. So everything we're speaking about today is, is about the way we are invited to sort of get out of our own way, to take a step back, to have a broader view, a greater view, and sort of disentangle ourselves from whatever the immediacy of, our, of a disturbance uh, might be or the impact it's having upon us. So this is what I was thinking. When a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a noise? <laughs> and I, I think that's kind of a silly um, statement because I, and no matter how much I ponder that and I understand the scientific way they talk about it, that you know, you have to, something has to be there to receive the vibration in order for it to be a sound. Uh, to me, it's like, no, the, the, it's whooshing through the air, it's, you know, making an impact. And I have a rather personal uh, story as to why I, I um, lean into the uh, idea that, yeah, it probably makes a noise even when you're not there. 
And my story is this. One time, many years ago, Hugh and I were hiking in the foothills right below the Sierra Madre Mountains in uh, North Glendora. There are lots of hiking paths back there. And I know it was a long time ago because I actually don't even recall the last time he and I hiked together. Um, but we were in this really pretty place in the canyon where there was a Girl Scout, um, sort of a retreat center. And from that center, it, it was uh, right on the, uh, the edge of a moving creek, and there were lots of hiking trails. And Hugh and I had been out there hiking for a while, and we hadn't passed another hiker in, in quite some time. In fact, I don't, I'm not sure we did at all once we got back in the canyon. And we were thinking, have you ever done that where you're hiking with someone and you're in nature or you're taken up in your own um, private uh, contemplation? And so we weren't conversing at all. It was very quiet. And I remember that there was just a light breeze so you could, you know, sort of hear the leaves moving in the trees. And there were um, um, a little critters every now and then would be disturbed by our presence and they would um, move around uh, in, the, in the canyon there. Um, and you could hear the, the leaves sort of crunching under your feet. And then all of a sudden, in the beauty of this sort of music of nature, there was this large, loud cracking sound and a giant branch from a really big tree only about 30 feet from the path where we were. It fell to our right. This branch broke off the tree, hits all the other branches on its way down, and crashes to the ground. It was a good-sized branch, and Hugh and I just froze. We just stopped, and we looked at each other, and he said something really funny like, um, Oh, I guess that answers that question. And, um, and I, I was still looking up at the top of the tree, expecting that there was a person up there who had just sawed off a branch. And I'm, I'm kind of confused, wondering why nobody hollered timber to give us a warning that the branch was coming. <laughs> what I learned that day was that nature has her own process for trimming trees that has nothing to do with me. And she doesn't care if I'm there or I'm not there. The business that goes on in nature will go on. And it was a, a rather important lesson for me to learn and to apply in, in this uh, thing called life and, and the way that my adventure brought me to spiritual leadership. When a tree naturally falls in a forest or a jungle um, or even here in the desert, sometimes the saguaro will just fall over. Several people have shared stories about what that's like if you, if you lose a giant cactus, a, a very tall cactus in your yard. It can do a lot of damage and it falls and it breaks into pieces. But here's the thing, when a, when a tree or a plant like that makes a natural, for whatever reason the death was, I'm just gonna say that looking at death as a part of the natural cycle of life, Nature immediately goes to work on doing something out of what's happened. And that's a wonderful lesson for us to sort of wrap our, our brains around. It's as though nature has the capacity to take advantage of whatever's thrown in front of her. And in terms of a, of a fallen tree, there's a lot of good things that can that, that come and, and that are actually necessary from that process. So when Holmes says that nature makes a demand upon herself, that helps me understand what that means. She knows what to do by the very nature of the intelligence in all of life that the next steps are, are very normal. So then if I expand that out and I begin to ponder that every tree has this amazing intelligence about it that allows it to live. That every plant, that every blade of grass has that very same intelligence governing the, 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 the direction of life. Now this becomes um, a, an interesting topic. Every living organism whether it's a, a galaxy and the way the stars are patterned in the sky, 
or the tiniest microbes that have to do with the, the way life works at that, that infinite, it, it, tiny, tiny level, um, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a wisdom there that we can learn from where every part of it is connected to every other part. And not only that, every part is connected to the greater whole of the universe. Run by the very same wisdom, the very same intelligence, because it's all from the same creator, the same substance of life. So when we think of, of something like a, a delicate colony of moss, that there's a whole system in that colony of moss that creates its own ecosystem. That it, it grows and it thrives under the governance of the intelligence of moss, whatever that is. But that same intelligence is what creates an ecosystem of giant redwood trees in a, in a, in a great forest. And each of those um, um, entities of life has a role in, in, the, in the greater system, the, the emergent evolution of, of all of life. So what we're looking at today is a continuing process. This is the, the definition of eternality. Um, there is a way that life is always in this process of becoming and therefore there's an intelligence that sustains not only life, but the ongoing process, the emergent evolution. Now, as human beings, we are right there, smack dab in the middle of it. In fact, we're of all creation, we're the, the thinking part of creation. And so we are using that same process. And you might say there's a way we could look at our individual lives, the way we're very different from each other, but that we are always growing uh, information, our own personal wisdom, our own spiritual maturity and understanding of the way life works, that, that we're a part of that based on the way that we accumulate um, our experiences and then um, make the story, you know, allow it to tell the story of our life or better yet, use our accumulated experiences to make decisions about our future and to be intentional and purposeful in the way that we, we live our lives. So when we are talking about the, the way that all of this works, there's a, 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 a way we can recognize the complexity of just the, the mind alone, the, our thought processes. And, and then I want to use that to help me understand so that I can grow in my own experience here um, by evolving new thought patterns in, in the way that I live and move and have my being in that one mind. The way that I become accountable for my own life, but with an awareness that that then ripples out into this greater um, ecosystem of ways I'm connected to everybody else and, and to life and the environment and all of that. Because I got excited about the topic of um, that when a tree falls, I was thinking about something I read a long time ago that even in a jungle, if a, a mature, very tall tree in a jungle um, falls and, and dies and falls to the ground, there's an immediate um, impact on all the growth beneath it because now the canopy is no longer intact in the way that it was. So there's the impact of a different kind of lighting in that portion of the jungle then. So now some things that only grow in the shade will also die out, but other things will begin to sprout up and grow again. Now I wanted to be able to tell you that from a more um, research sort of science-based way because I remember being really impressed when I heard it all and what happened was of course I got sidetracked and I found something else that interested me and fit with the topic of the redwoods <clears throat> and I stumbled on an article from the Pacific Northwest Research Station it was a group of three scientists uh, women and men 
who uh, did uh, intensive work in the 1970s on um, the redwoods and the ecosystems of a redwood forest. And, and they decided about 30 years later to rejoin, to come together again and see what newer information they could add that would give them greater wisdom on the research they had already done. And here's something I read that they, that they printed after that last time they got together. Fascinating quote. The more that we learn, the more we learn, the better we understand the connections of the wonderfully complex systems of life. The truth is, the forest system depends on the death of the trees. The forest absolutely requires death to survive. Wow, now that does something to me. When I look at that and I use nature as Emerson always invited us to think about nature as a way of understanding our own relationship to spiritual laws. If we, if we observe the laws of nature, it will take us into a deeper understanding of our own relationship in our individualized environments. When I think of that, it helps me understand that we are living in these great times of change. Some of the things that have changed in our lives will never return to what we used to call normal. And, and, it, and I'm stunned to see how quickly we have adapted to um, sort of a new idea. We, we're already trying to create a new normal, even though we're in this liminal time of, of sort of waiting for what's new to, to emerge. So we are grieving, whether we're aware of it or not, we are grieving losses that we have each experienced in our personal lives and, and the ways in which our lives will, won't be the same when, whenever we step out of being um, um, sort of estranged from each other. And in that sense of grief, like a fallen tree that has hit the ground, nature knows what to do with that. So it tells me in a very deep and personal way that what has been decaying for a long time, a lot of the change we're looking at, has been stuff that hasn't been working for quite a, a while. And now that's changing. And out of the decay, nature knows what to do. There's that great force recreating, revitalizing, reestablishing um, newness. So if I look at uh, the, the research from the study these great scientists did, they were talking about that the, the way that there are dead trees that stand and then there are trees that have fallen, dead trees that have fallen and that nature, the rest of life in those ecosystems, will use that which, which looks like death, they will use it to their advantage. So wherever there is a dead tree or a fallen tree, you will find this kind of rhyme, so I have to say it just the way they wrote it. There's foraging, there's nesting, there's denning, there's roosting, and there's resting. All of the flora and the fauna in the area will have a response to what has fallen and it begins to serve life immediately in a positive way. And so we here in the desert um, look at the saguaro and um, I love to hike in the white tanks and it, it, it's just so amazing to me how we are um, just a little bit of elevation makes those saguaro naturally thrive. Those are those, if you're not from here, those are those big cactuses that have arms and they look like people and they look like they're standing in funny postures and we like to imagine in our minds, um, um, you know, what, what, what they're representing. Now, my husband has a theory about the saguaros. When you're driving out of Phoenix and you're heading to the California border, you'll notice that there are just a few saguaros really close to the border, but once you cross the river, you don't see them anymore. And Hugh says that they're moving, but they just move really, really slow, so we can't quite see that, that they're actually moving and that they're trying to make their way to cross the border, but we'll see. I think they should just stay where they belong in Arizona, quite frankly. <laughs> but I remember the first time I went hiking in the... Um, 
white tanks and I saw the saguaros up close, it's quite interesting to see that if you look at them closely, they look like they're being eaten alive by insects and birds and, and uh, animals that hide and live in them. And, um, and they are, except that it is a natural part of how life sustains itself in the desert. So I didn't know that until I treated myself. I was a new resident in the state, and I found a book on just the saguaros, and it never once had a, a single piece of information in it about them dying. It spoke only on how amazing it is that they give the gift of life to so much of nature. And so can you see how, how that is a sort of backwards way of looking at it? In our human form, we often are only looking for imperfections. For some reason, the negativity pops out and that's all we see. It's sort of like getting, you know, you're having a talk with somebody and there's a spot on their shirt and you can't quit looking at it. You know, it's like that. It's like we have this way, we only focus on what's broken, but sometimes, we do not realize that what could look like it's broken is actually serving in a divine way for the enhancement of life. Now take a moment and just feel that. When a tree falls in the redwood forest, insects begin to tunnel into the wood. Fungi and colonies of moss begin to grow and to thrive in the shadowy side of the logs. And um, all the forms of life that begin to rejuvenate and sprout up from what's decaying, the decomposition, now revives the soil and we actually see that it enhances the, the forest floor. That there's this great, magnificent something that's happening as, as an emergent evolution in the cycle of life. Every structural component in the forest ecosystem has a role and they live in individual ecosystems and they expand out into grander ecosystems where everything is connected. <clears throat> the human body is one complex system of, of working structures that we rarely um, think about how incredible it is that our body works at the level that it does. The human body is always um, processing, assimilating, eliminating, doing all the things that are very natural in the, in the world of nature. And we, on our own, have this whole little ecosystem in our body, which is magnificent in the way it works, even in spite of that which ails us, or what we bellyache about, um, which comes with, uh, naturally, as it turns out, with aging, there's some bellyaching I didn't, <laughs> had no idea I'd have such opinions of, well, moving on. Um, and what we can see is that we also have not only a relationship, all the organs in our body know how to relate to each other, but then we, we relate in terms of communities. So I have a community in my neighborhood. What I, I do with that, um, you know, how far I extend that is up to me. I'm in choice. But I have a community in my neighborhood. And when I go to the grocery store, I have a community of people that I interact with. So people that are shopping, as I do, but there are people in my community at the grocery store that have been there all night stocking shelves and unloading trucks. And the community expands out to those people that have brought goods into the market in various ways so that there can be items on the shelves. We all understand that. We do not take that for granted anymore. Right? We know what it's like to step into a market and see bare shelves. So now it's like, I appreciate that community that takes the, the time and shows up day after day, even in the, a COVID crisis, they show up to work to make sure we can have something to purchase. And, and they, they, they create rules to keep us safe while we're doing it. We have a medical community where we turn to for our, um, 
our health needs. And of course, we have a spiritual community and it goes on and on and on. That we are vastly connected, uh, we extend out in a vast way and we are intimately connected in that inner way, in that networked way that we have relationship with everything and everyone. It's a normal process of life. And I wanna to read to you a quote that I found in page 104 in the Science of Mind textbook from Holmes. He says, the furtherance of evolution, here's where it gets juicy. The furtherance of evolution depends on our ability to sense a unity with nature and with her forces. So first of all, I mean, on one hand, I, I, it makes me laugh to think that I'm sitting in church and I get to talk about evolution. <laughs> um, but I love that idea that he's telling us that the way we further, we grow, we expand our view, we keep our consciousness in that expansive state of, of growth and openness, stay open at the top by sensing our unity with nature and her forces. So absolutely, may I, I just say, like when a bolt of thunder strikes somewhere and the thun a lightning strikes somewhere and the thunder you know, ripples out, that's a force of nature. When a big giant branch breaks off of a tree while I'm hiking in nature, that's a force that I am, whether I'm aware of it or not, I am unified with it, and it's a lot of power, and all of us have access to that. In the same way, nature just naturally does what she does. So, when a tree falls, does it make a noise? I don't know that it really matters, but here's something really extremely um, juicy if you're me, I love this. In that article that was done by a bunch of scientists at, at uh, oh no, I'm not there yet. It was done by a bunch of scientists and I found it on the internet somewhere. Credible people that really study the life of trees and forests. In the, in the beginning of that article was a quote and it happened to be a scripture from the Bible book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I happen to love scripture and I like the book of Ecclesiastes. It's, it's quite different than um, lots of the rest of the Bible. That's the book of, of the Bible where there's that fabulous reading, um, for everything there is a season. I actually like that better. That's the third chapter. I like that better than the 23rd Psalm. I love that chapter. But this was a quote taken from the 11th chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I went, ooh, that looks juicy. And it was about a fallen tree. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I have to look that up. Well, now, you, you, if you know me, you know that I just look it up. I don't go to Bible Gateway. But I have this big, thick, I should have brought it. It would have been really fun to show you. I always talk about it. It's a parallel Bible. It's way better than looking something up on the internet because what happens is I look up a scripture one time and there are four columns. Once I locate the scripture I want to look at and there are four different Bible translations right in front of my eye and so I can scan it all and then I can take the best of all of that and I can kind of chew on it and see what it says to me. So, oh, in addition to that, it has the best Bible commentary ever because the Bible commentary was written by, you know, my favorite Bible translator or paraphraser, I should say, um, Eugene Peterson. So I brought the quotation, but I put it in a bigger context so you could just hear the beauty of these words from Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter. And when I read it to you, all of Eugene Peterson, I'll be reading from the message. Um, I want you to hear not just what he's trying to say, but I want you to imagine these words are applicable in our own lives to everything that's going on in the world right now, because it is. So the title is, the chapter it has a subheading at the top that says, Boldly Face the Future. Isn't that beautiful? We are boldly facing our future. We're not bold every day. Some days I'm scared. You know, but we are bold. This is good biblical wisdom here. Boldly face the future. So when times get tough, listen to this. Be generous in your acts of charity. Share what you have. 
I love that because we have done a lot of sharing. You know, I love it when I've been in conversation with somebody and they need toilet paper and I need um, laundry detergent and we have enough of each to trade and share and nobody's short of anything, right? I love that we have done that and we have done that beautifully as we have been um, COVID uh, restrained or whatever you wanna call it. So share what you have and be a blessing to others. This could be your last night. So remember, here's what you know. This is the wisdom you already know. When the clouds are full of water, it rains. When the wind blows down a tree, it lies where it falls. Can you feel the essence of this? This is just life. When the wind blows down a tree, it will lie where it falls. So do not sit there watching the wind do your work. Don't stare at the clouds, get on with your life. I just feel like this is such a beautiful message. You know, I'm getting itchy for us to reopen this sanctuary, to have church in the building again. And so I love that it's so boldly saying, get on with your life. Don't just keep watching the clouds or the news, but get on with your life. Just as you'll never understand the mystery of life forming in a pregnant woman, so too you will also never understand the mystery at work in all that God does. When a tree falls, God is there. When a pandemic washes over the world, God is there, God is everywhere. And there is something immediately happening in the way that nature, life, this infinite intelligence of the entire universe knows how to use that which is decomposing as fodder to strengthen the soil that remains. These are powerful thoughts for us to ponder today. When I read, read this, when I, when I sat with this in, my, in the privacy of my office and I just let those words wash over me, what I realized was I know what I am called to do. All I could do was say yes, yes, I get it. I understand what it is I need to do. I need to stand strong in what I know. I need to return again and again at regular intervals to truth, to good, to beauty, to notice and appreciate the perfect order of the universe even in the way that a tree falls and creates fresh life again. There is a mystery in all of it that I do not have to understand. Life simply works. I am concerned that there are those among us who are missing that point. And I'm grateful that you're listening. I'm grateful that there are a few people here in the sanctuary with me. I'm grateful that there are people that know how to work the computer and I'm not here alone. Believe me, today when I tell you I am grateful for that, I really, really extra mean it. Um, let me just read some, a little more from Ernest Holmes on that same page 104. We are on the verge of disclosing a spiritual universe what we're talking about disclosing that which is already there but seeing it because some trees have fallen and changed our view there's more light now we are on the verge of disclosing a spiritual universe and the physical universe is is a spontaneous emergence that which emerges comes through the evolution of inner forces which cannot be explained but must be ex accepted. I was going to say expected, and that works as well. In fact, that might even be better for the message I'm trying to deliver today. Right? We want to see God in all of it. Now, I read, and I'll tell you, I have a little reluctance to even say this out loud, but I, I want you to hear me say this so you can hear what I'm going to say next. I read this week that seven out of 10 Americans is fearing the worst from the election. Seven out of 10 Americans. And that just makes me wanna cry. That's a, that's a I, I would like to just say I don't believe that. And yet what it does for me is it makes me stand up 
and be very clear and very firm that I will not be one who does not look for good here. I will not expect the worst. This teaching does not tell you, I mean, we teach the opposite, that we should expect the best, we should expect good, we should play with those desires within us. So if you have fear around that, it's absolutely normal. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that I do think it's not okay for us to expect the worst. I mean, what's really laughable about that is it doesn't even matter which side you stand on in this great um, split or disparity that we're looking at. And, it, it, you know, it, that everybody is just ready to, you know, throw it all in the handbasket and, and give up. No, we are spiritual beings first and we do not give up right? And we allow ourselves to remember to go back home and to revisit what we believe and what we know to be true. And when we forget and when we get swallowed up in everybody else's fear around it, then we call a friend or we write a prayer for ourselves, or I, I can go stand in front of the mirror and pray myself back, right? I mean, I don't even have to do that. You can do it in your car without, <laughs> you know, in the privacy of your car. I love to pray out loud in the car, but do not fall into that place of feeling like, you know, something big is falling and it's going to be dangerous. What we want to do is say, if, if that's true, something big is falling, what will this infinite intelligence of the universe do with this? How great a thing might this be if we would get out of the way of imagining bad and begin to imagine good? Please stand with me. Be, 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 let, let us outnumber those who imagine the worst and let's do our work to encourage each other to imagine the best and let's do that on a regular basis. I found a, uh, somebody sent me an amazing, amazing article that came out of UC Berkeley. And um, they have a lot of good, what they do well is all the mind science, um, the, everything latest on the brain. They have, they're very current in their information. And, and they have posted a new article, um, Surviving the Election. And it is really great. I'm going to see if, if I can get Kay to put the link in our newsletter. Now, just to remind you, if you don't get our newsletter, you can go to our website, wvcsl.com, and the website has a link to sign up for the newsletter. So I'm going to have the article. It's, it's kind of long, but it's so beautiful. Um, and I want to just tell you one thing today from that article that's so in line with everything we teach and what I always talk about, but something we can do right now because I, be, I want you to stand with me so that we can rebalance what's going on in the world. Pay attention to what's going on in your mind and in your body. Pay attention to what you're thinking about because what you're thinking about then stirs your body and there's a physical response in your body. Your body always knows what you're thinking. It's always eavesdropping. Uh, so they tell us from UC Berkeley, um, become aware of how you carry your stress and especially in how you're breathing. Listen to this quote. This knocks my socks off. Most people do not realize that breathing slowly and deeply can de-escalate a full-blown panic attack in a single minute. I'm going to read that to you again because if this doesn't impact you, it prob you probably have a loved one that has panic attacks. Most people do not realize that breathing slowly and deeply can de-escalate a full-blown panic attack in, um, in a single minute. That's, that's a really important thing to know. That's a great tool to have in your pocket. Um, I, I also read in the same article that if we take our hands, do this with me, get your hand warm, and now put a hand over your heart. And the warmth of your hand immediately begins to soothe your heart. What we know is that there is a connection between our heart and our brain and that the heart has neurons just in the same way the brain does. There are neural pathways in the heart 
and the heart is comforted by the warmth of our hand. And so by simply placing your hand on your heart, we're calming down the neurons that activate stress. So imagine, you're just going to sit, you could hold your hand on your heart, breathe, focus on relaxing, and begin to imagine images in your mind that, that are images of safety, and of trust, of goodness, and of well-being. Mm. This, my friends, is a practice of self-compassion. This is a way we can have compassionate mind mindfulness with an actual uh, physical practice in our lives. So be aware of what's going on inside of you. A couple of other things they say is, um, same thing I nag about every week, but they said it so I can quote them this week instead of just <laughs> preach at you. UC Berkeley says we should ask ourselves if we're getting enough good news in our life. If you are not getting enough good news in your life, you definitely want to do something about that. And um, I can help, but you know, you know what I say. I time it out, man. And it, if I'm not doing 51% positive, then, um, then I'm not. Then I'm. Then I'm just sunk down in the cloud of the general consensus, the, the consciousness of the 7 out of 10. I don't want to live there. I want to live above there. So pay attention to whether or not you're feeding yourself enough good stuff um, intellectually, uh, spiritually, etc. And a great way to start that is just to be grateful. So uh, what I'm asking today is for, um, uh, for everyone to really step up in your own personal accountability. I have a board meeting um, as soon as we say amen here. And um, I am going to be making a recommendation to the board that we set a very specific date. I can't bear it anymore. So I'm going to be, we're we'll be talking about reopening the center. Other uh, churches and centers have done that in our area. And I am personally ready, which means that you need to really do a personal um, um, internal um, you know review of how you feel what you believe and to be fully accountable for your own sense of safety and if it does not allow you to leave the house then I'm really encouraging you to stay home and for those of you who are really ready to get out I'm going to encourage you to come and join us um, I expect to give you a date by next Sunday. Actually, by this, I hope to have a date in the newsletter this week because I believe it's time. And I believe that we are mature, responsible adults and we can make the decision right for us individually. And we will not have opinions whether we're, you know, whether you need to stay home or you need to get out. We're just going to love each other. We are not going to. Uh, find a reason to stop the flow of love in our own mind and heart in, in any way. So just breathe that in. And I'm grateful that you created a space for me to say all the things I needed to say today, even for me to get a little um, um, riled up. <laughs> Would have been more fun to be standing for this message. That's what I'm telling you I know. Oh, sometimes I like to stomp my foot when I'm standing up. I'm really making a, home, uh, a point home. Oh, so let's make a point to anchor ourselves in that place called home, that place called truth. Just remembering as we breathe and transition from the spoken word to the word that is reverently prayed right where we are God is and I feel that presence of, of God of love I feel it within me and I know that it is that activity of life that continual movement that which breathes me and and pumps my heart and moves the blood through the, my body. And as this is true for me as a part of humanity, I know it is true for you as well. I know that there is an intelligence that governs life in every living thing. 
from the blade of grass to the squirrels that scamper through the forest to the insects that live in the decaying trunks of trees. Life everywhere present, the birds that fly through the sky and the little lizards that climb on our backyard walls, all of the creatures and all of humanity. And I recognize as I begin to turn my attention to the way that the human body so magnificently works in these processes of, of assimilation and elimination that we are healed of, of those things that ail us because that the, the body has an intelligence within it that desires to reveal that wholeness. The ecosystem of the, of the individualized living being and the ecosystem of this community that we join together in, in the consciousness of wholeness and of oneness. And so not only is there a healing from all of the conditions and the, and the physical ailments, we feel restored, restored that restoration process in our, in our being so that there's a vibrancy in the way we face life today but that there is a healing in our community as we prepare to rejoin in this sanctuary and, and live in a slightly different design in the interior of our building where we are safe, where we know how to practice the protocol that we have learned is what, what keeps us healthy now. And I know that we make peace with the difficulties that come in these in these days and these times of readjusting to the change and the tumultuous movement and that we embrace this truth that God is absolutely everywhere present, that nature is this great force and power that is always renewing life and expanding and becoming. And I am grateful to know this. I am grateful to know that this is the way that we are financially secure in, the, in our understanding of the law of circulation itself. I know that this is the way we experience healing with our loved ones. I know this is the way we can courageously step into that place of forgiveness, whether it is in, in personal relationships or just in the way we have had judgments as, as we're all moving through difficult times. I know that there's this great, big, beautiful love, this essence of God that is stronger than any other idea or force in the universe. And I am grateful for that. I say thank you, God. Thank you, life. Thank you, infinite spirit. I let it be and release it into that divine law, knowing it is already done. And together we say, and so it is. And so I will just pass my offering along to our helpers today. I've got, I have a couple of very happy to bring glad tidings and share. Um, and I thank you for doing the same. It's an incredible time, and we um, stay here because you're willing to share the, your, your financial good with us as well. Thank you for that. Uh, stay tuned. Lots of news upcoming. Have a blessed week. Remember truth. I love you.